असतो मा सद्गमया तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमया ओ शाति 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 ओ लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीडर्स फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीडर्स फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओ पीस 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 गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी इट्स वंडरफुल टू बी बैक हियर I offer my pranams to revered Swami Sarvadevanand Ji Maharaj and to the other revered monks and nuns present here pranams and namaskars to every one of you It's good to see so many familiar faces in spite of the partial anonymity of the masks I recognize <laughs> many if not most faces and some new faces too The subject that I wanted to speak about today was something that swami vivekananda spoke about here in los angeles uh, more than 120 years ago on ni- in 1900 on the 5th of january swami vivekananda gave a talk the open secret it's also sometimes it's also titled we ourselves so we ourselves are open secret the talks which swami vivekananda gave here in california in 19 in the 1900 uh, tour of lectures here and in northern california they are marked by a special power and luminosity a very high order very high non dualistic tone it's this radiance which swami ji always felt and dwelt in but it seemed to shine through Uh, his talks and he transmitted this special power especially in this talk if it's published in the second volume of the complete works of swami vivekananda and if you look at the sh- talk it's short at least what we have got of the talk it's uh, a few pages only slightly disconnected at times maybe something is lost in in between but one can see the power swami ji going into flights of eloquence and sort of radiating the non dual truth i will just dwell on a two or three points he makes two or three thoughts from swami ji so powerful so profound swami vivekananda starts with our experience of ourselves he says in a very simple way he starts he says that uh, look at these eyes our own eyes they're so small and insignificant and delicate and vulnerable just a pin prick can destroy these eyes and yet it is because of these eyes that the that the universe is revealed to us uh, he says the eyes see nature the eyes say nature you exist and nature exists of course he's putting it in a very simple way what he means is not just seeing seeing forms hearing sounds uh, you know smelling odors tasting flavor, flavors and touching you know soft and hard and, and heat and cold all the senses bring to us the news of this universe we are a subject and we experience an object all of our experiences of this form whatever experience we have worldly or spiritual subject and object we are here and we experience a world and the subject we i seem so small and insignificant in the face of this vast universe i'm so tiny and the universe is so vast and especially modern science and astronomy have revealed to us the unimaginable extent of this universe the physical the sheer physical extent of this universe and am i tiny in time also our lifetimes are but a speck in the cosmic scale of time a few years here gone today gone tomorrow and yet this tiny subject we it's because of us that this enormous well, practically eternal almost and tremendously powerful universe the masses of matter and energy playing around in time and space it is revealed to us on our side if you think about it on the side of the subject 
is mind, awareness, intelligence, purpose, meaning. But on the side of the universe, there is existence. There is, it seems to be, it's real. There is power. There is extensity, immensity. It seems so tremendously powerful and we seem so little. And yet, so much seems to depend on us uh, as knowing subjects. So Swami Vivekananda says, what is big and what is small? What is powerful and what is weak? And then he says, he makes a stunning move, he says, actually neither. Uh, neither, because not the subject, not the object. Underlying the subject and the object is one reality. It is one infinite reality which appears as the subject and the object, as us, the knowing subject, and this, the entire vast known universe. They are not two polarities, not two opposites, but underlying them there is a, uh, a reality which is appearing as both. He, he says one only exists. It appears as nature, soul, the person, and the objective universe. And then some of those typical Vivekananda phrases. The infinite is the finite, and the finite, infinite. I remember this verse immediately. It uh, came to uh, mind the famous mantra of the Upanishads. Purnamadaha purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vashishyate. That is infinite. This is infinite. This infinite has arisen, has arisen in that infinite or from that infinite. And in this infinite, if you discover the infinity here, then the infinity alone remains. This one word, purnam, purnam, it literally means complete, whole, full, infinite. If you want to take one word away from today's talk, I would urge you to take this word away from it, Purnam. You know, it, this word, and what Swami Vivekananda is trying to say here, this word is the profound secret of not only Vedanta, but the entire Hindu tradition. We'll see how. If there is one thing which encompasses, which epitomizes the, the entire wisdom of the Indian nation for 5,000 years. It is this one word, Purnam. I remember, as a little kid, I must have been seven or eight years old, in the ashram in Bhuvaneshwar, which I used to visit, I have a very distinct memory that in those days when you would go up the staircase, upstairs, the shrine was upstairs, um, you would have to pass through a small room before you entered the shrine. Now, it's all different now. It's a much bigger shrine. Now, it's been remodeled. But in those days, there was a smaller shrine and uh, with Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, the Holy Mother, and Swami Brahmananda. But before that, you would have to pass through a small room, a bare room. And in that room, there was only on one wall, there was this mantra framed. That is infinite. This is infinite. From that infinity, this infinity has arisen. If you discover that infinity in this infinity, then infinity alone remains. Om, peace, peace, peace. I remember it so vividly. I, I can still feel the cool stone steps I would climb. I can feel it under the soles of my feet. I can, I can see in my mind's eye that bare room and that mantra there, sunlight streaming through, there was stillness, a quietness, nobody else around, just that little kid staring at that. I don't know what I understood, but there was a feeling of great depth, a feeling of something very profound, something awakening. I mean, I have no qualms in saying there must be a past, a memory of past lives. Somewhere I must have come across that, uh, that mantra. I must, must have studied it in some past life or something. But I was, oh, uh, I was awestruck. There was nothing to see. But I still remember the quietness of that room. I still remember the, the, some, the feeling of a vastness, of her radiance streaming through. And those words, 
that is infinite. This is also infinite. And this infinite has come from that infinite. So what is that? That is the transcendent, the absolute, beyond time, space, causation. Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, the absolute which we talk about ad nauseum in, <laughs> in Advaita Vedanta. That is the infinite. And this infinite, the universe here, permeated by that divine, by that divinity. Swami Vivekananda, he said, we Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God. A very profound formulation of all of Hinduism, especially of Advaita Vedanta. A transcendent, immanent God. What does that mean? That infinite, the transcendent, beyond time, space, causation. Formless, beyond language, beyond even thought. That is the transcendent. And this infinite, whatever we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, not exactly what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, uh, not the pots and pans, but that divinity per uh, permeating this universe, the immanent. So that and this, that transcendent and this immanent are the same God. A tremendous statement. If you see Purnam Adah Purnam Idam, the two words Adah Idam, we are going deep into the analysis here. Adah means that. Idam means this. And that and this is the whole story of spirituality, religion, philosophy, metaphysics. That and this. But what is this uh, mantra saying? It is saying that is Purnam and the same Purnam is this. Now, what is so startling about it is it seems to erase the difference between the transcendent immanent saying at a deep level that which is transcendent is also immanent. That adaha, this idam, are negated. This is the uh, Advaitic concept of bādha. I was talking about it with our uh, brahmacharis here a couple of days ago. Bādha. Bādha literally means cancellation, negation, the ascertainment of falsity. That, the thatness that it is remote and removed from us in time, from beyond time, space, and causation. And the thisness that it is presented to us right now through all our senses. These two are negated. Cancelled in Sanskrit, Badhita, to show the underlying oneness or identity. Purnam. That is Purnam, this is Purnam. And that Purnam and this Purnam are not different. That and this appear to be different. Negate the that and this, only one reality remains. Purnam. That alone appears as the transcendent, and that which appears as the Imminent are both one and the same reality. Then, another very profound truth here. Purnasya Purnamadaya. From that infinite has arisen this infinite. And here, the entirety of causality is involved. You know, the idea of God as the creator and this universe as the created, creator and created. Um, karana Brahm, in Vedantic terms, Karana Brahma, Karya Brahma. The call Brahman as the cause of the universe and Brahman as the effect of this universe. Again, transcendent and imminent, but in different language, in language of causality. All of devotional religion, all of theistic religion is basically this, that there is a creator, there is a source, there is a reality from which all of this has come. To, in a very broad terms, this is all that is. But what is this mantra saying? Something stunning and profound. That which is the cause and that which is the effect. Purnat, the, in Sanskrit, that last that suffix indicates the fifth case, which means the source, that from which something else has come. Purnam. This is the infinite, the first case. It means this is this reality is a product, and that reality is the source. That is the cause, this is the effect. And what does this mantra say? No, no. 
go deep enough to the heart of reality, you cancel the cause, you cancel the effect. In Vedanta, they will say, Karya Karana Vilakshana Brahma, the reality which is, uh, which is beyond cause and effect. It's neither the cause nor the effect. It is the one reality beyond cause and effect, which appears as cause and effect. The causality of Brahman, the, co the Brahman is the cause is negated, and Brahman is the effect is negated. Actually, the other way around. Brahman is the effect is negated, that means this effect is not real in itself. And the, if the effect is not real, then how can Brahman be the cause? And therefore, Brahman alone remains neither cause nor effect. Now, this sounds awfully abstract. Let me use an example. Uh, Shankaracharya himself, in Aparokshanubhuti, he uses, gives an example, the classic Vedantic example of a pot. And so, why a pot, of all things? Well, that was uh, sort of the most common thing that was available, I suppose, in ancient times. If you do an archaeological dig, what do you, what do you find in any part of the world when you're investigating an old civilization? You find pottery. So I guess there are lots of pots around. He says, take a pot. It is Vedantic magic. He's going to, he says, take a pot and he's going to make it disappear in front of your eyes. So he says, take a pot. And you begin with, you know, it's called a pot. What you have in your hand, it's a pot. It looks like this, it feels like this, it has a particular name and you can put stuff in it. It's a pot. But then you are told, Pot is not the ultimately real thing. What is a deeper reality, more fundamental reality about the pot is clay. In what sense is the clay more fundamental? Well, it was clay earlier, it's clay now, and one day when the pot breaks, if you break the pot, it'll still be clay. So clay is more fundamental than the pot is barn. Clay is not barn. Pot exists, pot lives, and the pot dies. Clay does not die. It was clay earlier, before the pot was born, and is clay, and continues to be clay. So clay is the reality. The second stage. First stage, pot. Now we have introduced a new reality, a deeper reality. Why is it deeper? Deeper because more fundamental than the pot. Clay. Now you investigate. What is uh, this clay? Where is this clay? And we are told, look at the pot which you are holding. If you investigate the pot, you will find what you are touching is clay. You see, what you, if you touch the pot, you're actually touching clay. Like if I touch this lectern, I'm touching wood. So you touch the pot, you're touching clay. It's clay on the top, it's clay on the bottom, it's clay on the inside, it's clay on the outside, it's clay through and through. Every bit of the pot is clay. That's stage three. Where do you discover that new reality called clay? There itself in the pot. Every bit of it is clay. And the fourth stage would be you realize there is no substantial entity called a pot, apart from the clay. What is the pot then? It is the clay, but it's, an, it's a new shape. It's a new use, and it's a new name. In Sanskrit, nama, rupa, vyavahara, rupa, form. A new form appears, a new name is, a designation is given to it, and many new uses are possible. All that is admitted, nama, rupa, vyavahara. All of this is what Vedanta will ultimately call Maya. Why call it Maya? Because they have no existence apart from the clay, apart from the substance. So now in the fourth stage, you have ended up with clay alone. Think about where you started. You held a pot, and what, if you were asked what is it, you would have said it's a pot. As after these four stages of analysis, pot, cause of the pot, material cause of the pot, clay. Investigation into it, finding every bit of the pot is clay. And then finally seeing that there is no pot apart from the clay. So you started with a pot. What did you end up with? Clay. Where did the pot go? It was never there, actually. It was an appearance, and it continues to be an appearance. It is a name. You can use the name for the appearance. And it's a use. It has use. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara, name, form, and transactions, uses continue, but the uh, but the reality now we discover is clay. The, the process must be completed. And then what's the point of all of this? Notice then, first you were told that there is a reality called the pot. And then you were, you were told, we were told that the pot is an effect and its cause is a material called clay. So we have a cause-effect relationship. Okay, 
Then you go further. You try to find out where is this material called clay, we find everywhere in the so-called effect. All of it is nothing but the material called clay. And then we end up seeing that there is no effect at all. The pot has no, subst effect has no substantial existence. I hope you're with me. I remember reading this, you know, when the kids, we used to read Tintin comics. <laughs> and those of you who have read, so there's a professor, Professor Calculus. And once he is explaining something about nuclear physics, and behind him Tintin and Captain Haddock and the Thompson twins, those who you know, you know what I'm talking about. They are walking, and the professor says, I hope you're following me. And Captain Haddock, who's not understanding any of this, he scowls and says, yes, we are right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so the effect, the pot, has no substantial existence. Therefore, the effect does not exist. Follow me here carefully. Effect does not exist. And therefore, if the effect does not exist, what is the cause a cause of? Why would you call it a cause? The clay is just clay. I'll run through the steps quickly again. Pot. We give it a name, effect. Oh, it's an effect. What's the cause? Clay. Good. Investigate. Where is this clay? It's just clay through and through. There is no substantial reality countable apart from the clay. If you count clay, one. Pot, number two, no. There's no second thing called pot. So the effect does not exist independent of the cause. If the effect does not exist, why would you call the cause a cause? Shankaracharya says the causality of the cause is lost. And therefore the clay remains neither cause nor effect. This process must be completed. Otherwise what happens in the words of Alan Watts? He put it very nicely. He said, he called it, if you don't complete it and you leave it as cause and effect, God and world, and leave it like that. Clay and pot, he says he calls it the crackpot theory. <laughs> what will happen is, there is a God who created this universe, cause, universe, effect, like the pot, like the clay. Uh, there is a God who created the universe, cause and effect. And then, if you don't complete the investigation, find out where God is, what God is, you'll be left with two things and forever searching for a God, a creator God. Swami Vivekananda says, neither cause nor effect. And that mantra says, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnam. Not effect and therefore not cause. Purnam alone appears as all of this. So this is the uh, deep reality. From this you can see a corollary, just an implication, just a derivation would be non-duality. See, what is non-duality? If there was a separate clay and a separate pot, if there was a separate God and a separate world, then you would have duality. When I, when I came here, somebody warned me, you are going to the West, and when you go there and you talk about duality, non-duality, everybody will think in Christian terms of good and evil. Huh? Uh, not in those terms, in ontological terms, in metaphysical terms, in terms of existence. Are there separate plural existences? Or is there one non-dual existence? So Advaita Vedanta claims there's one non-dual existence. If there is no cause, no effect, then the reality remains non-dual. There is no second thing apart from that reality. Purnam. All our Advaita Vedanta is just one small consequence of Purnam. Let's go deeper into it. It's Purnam. Why did I say it is the most profound secret at the heart of not only Vedanta, of Hinduism? If it is Purnam, then no difference between the God with form and God without form. What a tremendous de uh, debate. Sakara, Nirakara, with form and without form, led to so many quarrels, reform movements and uh, um, fights and violence and um, these uh, people, Hindus are idolaters, break the idols, uh, God must be uh, uh, with, uh, without form. Without form and with form. Which one is correct? Purnam, the same reality which, appear, which is experienced or realized as formless and with form. All right, with form, male or female? Male or female? 
Hinduism says both and beyond both. So we have no problem at all with the modern LGBTQ movement at all. <laughs> I, last year I was at, at, at Harvard for, uh, with a fellowship for a few months and the first thing we were given as buttons with preferred pronouns. So he, him, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs, and more. And there was even a blank one. You can put in your own title, whatever you want. <laughs> and people asked to select the ones they liked and put it on. I collected all of them. So, <laughs> Purnam. So, so they thought, this guy must be really advanced on the cutting edge of the LGBTQ revolution. Yeah, they found it difficult to understand. I, I, I remember going for the first time to the Widener Library. Uh, it's the largest academic library in the whole world. You go in there and uh, the uh, front desk, they say, ma'am, this way. Ma'am. <laughs> Not their fault. <laughs> if you're dressed like this, wearing a dress. <laughs> Perfectly all right, Purnam. Uh, sometimes when I'm asked to give talks on Hinduism, and I want to impress upon people the tremendous diversity of ideas which are, which are encompassed in Hinduism. I say that if you ask a question to Hinduism, the answer will always be yes and no. Do Hindus believe in God? Yes, no. <laughs> Is God with form? Yes and no. <laughs> Is God male? Yes and no. <laughs> so God, male or female? Purnam, that which appears as the male deity, and that which appears as female deity. I asked a rabbi once, uh, why is it difficult to conceive of God as female in, in Western thought, um, in Judaism or Christianity? And then, uh, he, only half jokingly, he said, you know, with all respect to all the ladies present here, he said, you know, it's difficult to conceive of God being up there with a high-pitched, squeaky voice, and, <laughs> and the divine voice coming down. It's <laughs> In Vedanta and Hinduism, there's absolutely no problem. Purnam, male and female, beyond gender, with form, without form, along comes the Buddhist, and he says that, no, 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 I don't believe in your God. With form, without form, all of that is just a superstition. Where is this God you're talking about? Male, female, in animal forms, in this form, that form? Ridiculous. There is no such thing. I will investigate my own existence and find out the reality within, beyond the changing body and mind, the reality. He's not going to talk about an immortal Atman also. And Hinduism says, perfectly all right. That reality which the theist discovers in the quest for God realization is the same reality that the yogi, the Buddhist, and the Jain, the Sankhyan discovers with the investigation within. That the reality outside, Purnamadaha. And the reality within, within, Idam, is the same reality. What is that? Purnam. That is the meaning of tat tu amasi, that thou art, that reality which you are investigating there and, and worshipping there, and devotion, and the reality within you, same thing. There's a beautiful story about the golden Buddha, which I love. Um, it seems in a monastery in Thailand, uh, they had this big image of the Buddha, but it was made of clay. And they had an, um, a story that many hundreds of years ago in our temple, there was a golden Buddha. But there were invasions or there were robbers and it was lost. But now we have this clay Buddha and that's fine. And at one time the clay Buddha needed some touching up, some repairs, so skilled workmen were called and they worked on it. And one day one of the workmen rushed to the abbot of the monastery and said, Venerable, come, come quickly we found some gold inside the clay. And they quickly removed the clay as much as possible. And the more they removed it, the more the gold underneath shone through. What had happened was, centuries ago, there was some kind of attack, and some quick-thinking monks had clever, covered the golden Buddha with the clay and given out the story that the golden Buddha is gone. The clay Buddha, this body of flesh and blood, 
with prana coursing through it, with mind full of thoughts and feelings and memories and ideas, and with the intellect deciding this or that. Beyond that, if you push in deep sleep, a blankness, the panchakosha, the five layers of clay, the golden Buddha is within us. It's the same reality which you are investigating outside. When the Buddhist says, I'm not interested in your God. Uh, I'm either atheist or agnostic. I don't believe in it. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in the reality within us. So what ex exactly is going on here? And the Vedantin says, fine, because Purnam. The Sankhya philosopher says that there's a distinction, bhay, the difference between consciousness and matter. Prakriti Purusha Veda. Fundamental distinction. You are consciousness, you are spirit, and this universe is matter. And Vedanta says, both are manifestations of one reality. Purnam. Creator and created, Prakriti and Purusha, the human and the divine, formed and formless, God and self. Purnam, one reality shining through. What is the consequence, the result of all of this? As all bheda, as we look through all bheda, difference, uh, and see the Purnam, and we realize there's one divinity shining through, then all what is called Raga and Dvesha, the particular, the obsessions and hatreds, the prejudice, the negativities, they, they are erased. If you see the same divinity in the high and the low, if you see the same divinity in the king and the pauper, you see the same divinity in the learned and the ignorant, you see the same divinity shining through in the rich and the poor, in the mighty blue whale and, and uh, yes, even in the COVID the virus, in the quasars and the quarks, the same divinity everywhere in the, the macrocosm and the microcosm. Why would you discriminate? Why would you feel that is better than this? All phenomena, as the Buddhists would say, are actually empty. And they're grounded in this Purnam. Buddhists wouldn't say they're grounded in the Purnam. We are saying that's grounded in the Purnam, in this infinity. One infinity appearing in all differences. By the way, here, uh, always I have in my mind professors, philosophers, you know, they would say, hang on, that sounds very cute, but uh, it doesn't work. How can you, for example, how can you assert contradictory ideas at the same time? It sounds great that there is some uh, reality which, uh, you know, which reconciles both. How can you reconcile contradictory ideas, form and formless? Dr. Ramakrishna did it. He said, it is the same water which freezes uh, and takes form in icebergs and then melts and is, is a formless water with the same substance. But anyway, contradictory uh, ideas, how, do you, how are you erasing them? How are you uh, uh, substituting one homogeneous sameness? That is a misunderstanding of Vedanta. None of the differences are erased. It's very important to understand. None of the differences are erased. All differences are valid at their level of reality. So, um, yes, education is better than being illiterate. Healthy is better than being sick. And differences are definitely there, and they are valid. To be spiritual is better than to be worldly, though both are Purnam. But at that level, these differences are there. Science is there and fully affirmed. This is one of the beauties of Advaita Vedanta. At no point is science contradicted. If you misunderstand Advaita Vedanta, I've seen this objection coming from consciousness studies experts, you know, modern consciousness studies um, uh, investigators. If you do that, you say, Swami, science is not possible. Science is entirely possible. Science is entirely possible. But what we are saying is, there is a deeper level of reality where it is one. And it can be experienced, it can be understood, and then experienced, and it is fulfilling. So all differences, when they are erased at that level, at the level of activity. See, a movie screen, you can have a movie with hundreds of characters and hundreds of activities and a plot. It could be a comedy, it could be a tragedy. Uh, hundreds of movies can be played on the same movie screen, which makes all these movies possible. How can you say a, a tragedy is the same as a, as a comedy? You can say that if both are movies playing on an underlying screen. 
There's a reality which you experienced as the movie called a tragedy. There's a reality, same reality, which you experienced as the movie called a comedy. And that does not erase, as I want to emphasize, does not erase in any way the difference between a tra tragedy and a comedy. You say it's all the same, a mass of nothingness. No. Not only does not erase, it makes possible the experience of difference. It explains the experience of difference. How is multiplicity appearing before us in this way? Once this is realized, we are at a deep level, at, a, at, at our deepest level, at least philosophically to, be, to begin with, we are free of these differences at our deepest level of understanding. And that really sets you free. Jivan Mukti, the goal of Vedanta, being free while living, it becomes possible because of Purnam. Once this is realized. See, if it's not realized, what will happen is, my God, there, and I worship that God, and because of that God, I will be free. And then what about the rest? I'll be free of the world. The world has to be given up. I'll go to heaven. Difference. Incompleteness. And the Buddhist says, I reject your God and I want to investigate myself. Fine, it's a valid spiritual path. But still, difference is there. When the yogi says, in samadhi I shall attain to the divine and experience the divine. But you have to close your eyes, shut out the world. There's still difference is there. In this uh, insight, Purnam, there's no difference. One great Advaitin once said, Advaita Vedanta is not meant for erasing the experience of the universe. It makes you completely free and limitless. This is a word he used, it's very difficult to translate into English, nirbhad banata. It makes you completely free, sort of limitless in the world of experience, completely fearless. You are this infinity. What can hurt you? At the level of the infinity. Yeah. So, it makes, this Purnam makes possible freedom. Jivan Mukti. What else? It makes for harmony. You can easily see how it will make for harmony. If you hold on to God, then the Buddhist will seem like an atheist. I know one Swami, a senior monk of our order, very wonderful Swami, but very devotional. And he, he was very annoyed with Buddhism. He said, it seems like half a religion. Where is God? <laughs> that there is ethics and there is meditation and that's all good. Where is God? How can you have religion without God? <laughs> so there is division. But then there will be always be quarrels. I am right. You are wrong. You worship images. God is without form. If God is without form, then who is the one with form? I'll, I can't resist telling this to you. It's in Hindi. I'll try, I'll try to translate into uh, English as, as much as possible. Uh, well, there was a gentleman who was uh, a pundit, a strong du uh, dualist. Uh, and he would go to this monk, it's in the Himalayas, and he would argue, the monk was a non-dualist, who said there's only one reality. And this pundit argued that, no, there are two. Uh, there is God and there's the rest of us. There's a difference. And finally, um, the monk once said, um, in Hindi I'll translate, he said, Dwait satya hai, wo to gau bhi janti hai, to pandit hai, to kuch nahi baat bata. As he says, if duality is true, if duality is real, that cow, yonder cow chewing the grass knows that duality is real. The grass is different, I am different, I have to chew the grass and put it inside me. The cow knows that. You are a pandit, tell me something new. <laughs> After all these arguments, after all, the, the pundit came finally to the monk and he said one day, he said, sir, you are right. Non-duality is true. And so he said in language, nirakar, the formless non-dual truth. Nirakar hi satya hai, aap theek kehte hai, Mahatma Ji. The formless non-dual reality is the truth. You are right, Swami. And immediately the Swami shot back. He said, Nirakar satya hai to sakar tera chacha hai. <laughs> now, this is colloquial Hindi. I'll have to translate um, as best as I can. It's like, if the formless non-dual truth is the truth, then what is the one with form? Your uncle. <laughs> that doesn't have the same punch as it does in the Hindi. <laughs> it's something like saying Bob's your uncle or something like that. You know? uh, who's that? What he meant was Purnam. 
that which you uh, it is ascertained as ultimately non-dual, formless in Advaita Vedanta is also exactly what you worship as Vishnu, as Durga, as Kali, uh, as the avatars, um, uh, you know, uh, Krishna, Christ, uh, Ramakrishna, all the all of them with form, Purnam. It makes possible harmony. It brings an end to. Uh, into quarrels, it brings an end to violence. I remember in the World Parliament of Religions in, um, when was that in Toronto, 2019 or 2020? 2019, yes. Um, so everybody there in the World Parliament of Religions, you, you know, people will be there, they are all, uh, um, it's like preaching to the choir. Everybody is talking about harmony of religions, uh, that it, all religions lead to the same goal, and so on, so forth. But there was one young man, uh, an evangelical Christian. They normally they do not come for uh, all this harmony of religion stuff. You know. But he came. And his point, he made a very good presentation, that how can you uh, include um, evangelical churches within the, you know, the activities of different interfaith activities. So very good. And it was, it was uh, heavily attended because it was a different kind of presentation. Here is somebody who does not agree with the harmony of religions, who does not agree that different religions are true and they can lead to the same goal. So um, he's, I asked him, what is the core belief? He said, we want to live like Jesus taught us, taught us to live and tell others how they are wrong and bring them to our path. <laughs> now, you may well laugh. I understand where we are coming from. We are coming from the same place. But it's very important for them because I asked. The first part I have no problem with. It's beautiful. Do you want to live as Jesus taught you to live? It's amazing, beautiful. But why is it central for you to tell people that they are wrong and you must come to our path? And he said, well, that's the way it is. We have been taught that. That's, uh, it is a central uh, thing. Because we are right and you are wrong. And that... I remember having this debate on a long flight with this gentleman sitting next to me. He was the pastor of a small church in the Midwest, and you know what it's like. But it was very cordial, very uh, respectful, nice debate we had. And he wouldn't budge an inch. I'm right, not only you, everybody else, including the other little darn church across the street, they are all wrong. <laughs> and it was clear that everybody, every one of you, is going to hell. And so fine. But what he said at the end was very interesting. He got up and he said, well, Swami, and uh, he said, well, Swami, I know I'm right, but if I did not, I would say you are talking sense. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of sense in this, even if one is not convinced finally, but one's intellect says that, yeah, it, it is, this could be right. And, and it's... It's a much better way of looking at this world. Yeah. Much better way of looking at this world. It enables you to be inclusive. It enables you to be kind without erasing any, diff any of the differences. What people are afraid of is we'll be amalgamated in our, our uniqueness will be lost. No, your uniqueness will not be lost. When you play different movies on the same screen, are the movies mixed up and jumbled? And not at all. So Purnam, it makes for harmony makes for peace. Not just between religions. Sister Nivedita says, henceforth, after Vivekananda, in, in her magnificent introduction to the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, it's worth reading. If you do not read the complete works, do read it, but if you do not read it, but at least read the first few pages or the first volume, Sister Nivedita's introduction. And he says, henceforth, she says, there, henceforth, no distinction between the sacred and the secular. No distinction between the sacred, sacred and the secular. To labor is to pray. To have and hold is as stern a trust as to quit and renounce. The, the, this, um, you know, like the, the shop of the shopkeeper, the, uh, the, the, uh, the factory of the workman, and maybe the study of the scholar, I'm adding that, but all of those are as fit meeting places between God and man as the cellar of a monk. How can she say that? Purnam. She says, Swami Vivekananda told us that religion, art, and science are different ways of attaining to the same spiritual realization. 
But, he said, he added, Swami Vivekananda added, but you need Advaita to understand this. What did he mean? He meant Purnam. So this is at the heart of Advaita Vedanta. Swami Vivekananda just puts one pithy sentence. The infinite, the infinite is finite. And the finite is the infinite. Purnamadah Purnamidam. And he says, we have a memory of this. We have it. We feel this. Nobody wants to die. We want to survive. Not only do, you, do we want to survive, we want to be aware. If somebody says, yes, you're going to sur survive, but you're going to be in the hospital in a coma in the ICU, and you can survive for centuries like that. No. I want to experience. I want to be able to, you know, I be, I be aware and know things. All right, you will, be, you will survive, you will be aware, and you will know things, but all you will know is misery and pain and, and su suffering and sorrow. No, I want to be happy uh, without limit. I want to live without limit. I want to know without limit. I want to be happy without limit. Sat, chit, ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. Without limitless existence, limitless awareness, limitless joy or, or uh, uh, fulfillment. But then Swami Vivekananda also says, it's, uh, it's true in a way, but it's also the fact that it's sort of instinctive. We don't know it specifically. Uh, we have, it's either covered over by a veil of ignorance or we have forgotten it, what, whatever way you put it. The fact is, all this we are talking about is not available to us right now, at this state. And because it's not available to us, and yet we have a kind of atavistic, kind of instinctive feel for it, he says then, Swamiji says, every civilization in the world, every religion in the world has had this quest for freedom. Nature wants to crush us down. You know, we're a tiny subject, vast objective universe. Nature wants to snuff us out, to crush us down. And we rebel and say we will be free of this. This quest for freedom is at the heart. It is the engine which powers all spirituality across the world, across time, across civilizations this quest for freedom. Swami Vivekananda says, first, man imagined or conceived of beings who were free. The gods of the original primordial religions. They were beings who were more powerful than us. They were free of the limitations we were subject to. And we projected this freedom outside and we thought of God. And these beings finally coalesced into one supremely powerful being. Not just power, but also goodness. Far better than we are. Completely, just totally loving, caring. There's a perfection. All power, all knowledge, all love, all put together. This, this conception of God, this is the most free being we can conceive of. And that is God, the God of religion. I mean, just think about it, this, this idea of beings who are more powerful than us, more free than us. <coughs> Swami Harinamandi told us, uh, told me once that, you know, because the United States, we in America, this is a new civilization. We don't have the ancient mythology that, you know, for example, India has thousands of years of stories and uh, myths. And um, <coughs> that's why we take our superheroes so seriously. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, continuously amazed at how much uh, emotion it evokes. Uh, they are fans of more than uh, Pepsi and Coke. They are fans of DC Comics Universe and Marvel Comics Universe and Superman and Batman and Spider-Man. They're imaginary. But no, they respond to something deep within us, the feeling that there is a possible, a much better life is possible. Put them all together. In the most refined form, you have the God of religion. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, present everywhere, all-powerful, all-loving, most virtuous. Not only did God make man in his image, man also made God in his image, in the deepest sense of what is within. And then man established a relationship with this God. This, after the goal is freedom. The goal is freedom, mukti. Oh, that's all right, thank you. Goal is freedom or mukti. And man established a relationship with this God. Uh, so that by the grace of this God, I will get mukti, freedom. God is my master, I am the servant. 
dualistic relationship. Or I am, I am a part of God. I am divine too. God is the vast divinity. God is the sun of which I am a ray. I am a spark of that divinity. Qualified monism, Vishishta Advaita. I'm finally coming to the grand conclusion of the Advaita Vedanta, where you realize that that divinity which I'm seeing out there is actually I. Aham Brahmasmi. I am that. And then you have Purnam, the oneness of the self and the cosmos, the microcosm and the macrocosm. This quest for freedom, starting with our human life, in our human activities, proceeding to spirituality, from dualism to qualified monism to uh, non-dualism. Take a quick look. I'll be, take a few minutes. I'll survey this uh, whole quest for freedom in 5,000 years of Indian thought. In, in one way, if you look at Indian thought, all of Indian philosophy, it's this immortality, this, this freedom project, this project of seeking freedom. Heinrich Zimmer, the Indologist, he said the philosophies of India are not pessimistic. They talk in pessimistic terms about this world, but they are profoundly optimistic because each of them, I'll exclude the, the materialist, each of them has this grand vision of human possibility, which we, will, we can and we must attain. It's possible. This freedom is attainable. What is pessimistic? Pessimistic is this is all that there is, make the best of it, what can we do, that's it. When you're dead, you're gone, that's it, finished. That is pessimistic. So, this freedom quest. The materialist said freedom, the charvaka, the materialist said that freedom is when the body dies and that's it, you're gone, finished. So that's the charvaka. Freedom is the death of the body. And that's pretty much the world view of uh, modern materialist reductionist science, but not just science, a sort of popular world view. And I think that's always been popular. The charvaka literally means the sweet talker, mm -hmm. that which is very uh, acceptable, pleasurable to us. Somebody told me a famous phrase, I mean a well-known phrase, YOLO. Yes, some of you know it. A younger audience, a big burst of laughter would have been there. <laughs> Many of you do not belong to the, luckily, to the YOLO generation. The YOLO means you only live once. You only live once. Therefore, therefore what? Therefore, fill your life with frivolities and superficialities. Continuously do something, go there, eat this, meet that person, and always remember to take selfies and upload. <laughs> that is the Charvaka worldview, because at the end of it, life is over, that is freedom. That is the materialist worldview. The Buddhist comes along and says, no, life is not over. Those same negativities, desires, imperfections, you know, the grasping more and more and more, it will continue. Body will die. But in the body, even you, the materialist, you feel a first person existence, uh, this, this mind. I'm going to go very fast. 5,000 years I have to cover in five minutes. <laughs> so the Buddhist says it will continue lifetime after lifetime. New bodies will come up. It is a series of momentary existences. The, it'll be carried over from past lives. It will not end. This cycle of births and deaths, this suffering will go on. You'll be whirled around in this wheel of samsara until you reach nirvana, freedom. Not by the death of the body, but by the, uh, by the extinction of desires. With the extinction of desires, this flame which is burning uh, the, from lifetime to lifetime will be extinguished. This is the original meaning of the word nirvana, to extinguish and you'll be free. But then it raises the uncomfortable question, who is free if everything is extinguished? Yeah. So the Buddhists, later Buddhists, uh, the Vigyanavadis, I mean, with apologies to 2,500 years of Buddhist thought, it's completely unfair to you know, oversimplify like this. The later Buddhists, they said, only the negativities are extinguished, pure consciousness, a stream of pure consciousness, momentary pure consciousness, continues. And that is what is, I will use the, the term for Tibetan Buddhism, conventionally designated as Buddha. They're very careful with their words. No self, no permanent self. The Jaina comes and says, what is this? 
There is somebody who is in bondage. There is somebody who will be liberated. By the exhaustion of bad karmas through intense austerities, finally the self, there is the self, it will rise to, literally they use the space metaphor, it will rise to the top of the cosmos. Aloka Akasha, the light, the sky of light. And there you will reign in solitary splendor. The word used is kevalin. Kevalin, from which the word kaivalya has come. Very ancient word, before Buddhism. You remain in solitary splendor, something like what much later the German uh, philosopher, mathematician Leibniz, he talks about monads, you know, like stars in the night sky. You remain in solitary splendor. That is freedom. Then along comes the Nyaya Vaisheshika philosopher and says uh, that we, the self, the freedom must be freedom from suffering. So the self is trapped in this cycle of suffering because of wrong knowledge and by right knowledge, by right knowledge they mean the knowledge of the seven categories of the Vaisheshika or the sixteen categories of the Nyayika, Shodasha Padartha, Saptadasha Padartha. I'm not explaining anything, I'm just rushing through. By that knowledge, you will realize what you truly are and what you are not, and this will lead you not to um, act out of wrong knowledge and out of desire. Not acting like this, past karma will be exhausted, no new karma will be added, and after death, no new birth will be dead there. And the self, the Atman, here we first come across the Atman idea. The Atman will remain ever free. No consciousness there also. Just the Atman is free. Then comes uh, the Sankhya and the Yoga philosopher and says, what, what does this freedom mean without consciousness? So you are of the nature of awareness and the material world is of the nature of not aware, insentient. Sentient and insentient, they have been mixed up due to error, that is samsara, when through proper knowledge and cultivation of samadhi, you see the difference between yourself and nature, between spirit and matter. This distinction is clearly appreciated. Uh, through Sankhyan discrimination, uh, discernment, or through yogic, sam or both through yogic samadhi, uh, some pra uh, some pragyata, pragyata samadhi. There's an arising of knowledge called viveka khyati, the difference between spirit and matter. You are free. Uh, kaivalya, they use the word kaivalya. These are ancient words. Um, kevalin, kaivalya, nirvana, moksha, mukti is of course a very common word, apavarga. The Nayaikas use this word. Then along comes the various schools of Vedanta. God exists by the grace of God we get freedom. The dualistic schools speak about four kinds of freedom. You go to heaven, the, the you know, Vaikuntha, the, the abode of Vishnu, or Kailasha, the abode of Shiva. And there you become a citizen. You get your citizenship there. And that's a freedom. It's called Salokya, um, Mukti. Freedom in the same abode as the, as the Lord. There are grades to that. Sometimes you get a job which allows you to hang around God there. So that is Samipya. You, uh, you are in the presence, in the divine presence. Not only in the same abode, not only in heaven, but in the divine presence. Samipya Mukti. But even more than that, um, you become like God. You begin to look like God. It's called Sarupya Mukti. And that's not so strange. It is said that, you know, husbands and wives who are married for a long time, they begin to resemble each other. And, and uh, not just that. It even say, they, they say that if you have had a dog for a long time, the master and the dog also tend to be, become more and more like each other. So if a dog can program you to become more dog-like, God can do the same. The more, it's not uh, strange that if you contemplate God intensely, at the time you are in the abode of the Lord, you will become divine-like. And then Sayujya, you merge with God. These are some four of the forms of uh, freedom talked about in devotional religion. Um, there is freedom in Advaita Vedanta. What kind of freedom are we talking about? in Advaita Vedanta. Freedom is not something to be attained. It is another name for you, the real you. You are freedom itself. You are never in bondage, nor do you actually attain to freedom. They say, praptasya prapti, what was already yours, you get it or regain it by knowledge, by um, realization that I always was free. What bound me? Nothing bound me. Once Swami in the Himalayas, he said, what is the cause of bondage? 
in Hindi, he said, Bevkufi matra, stupidity alone. <laughs> Nothing binds you really. Freedom. Our real nature is freedom. And Swami Vivekananda ends with uh, a soaring, you know, uh, he says, assert this freedom. You are that it always, always tell yourself, I am it, I am it, no matter how much the problems, here's the problems of the world. Let sickness come and, you know, difficulties come uh, like mountain high. You assert the, your true nature that I am this infinite reality and they will disappear. He, he says, 120 years ago, here, standing here in Los Angeles in California, he said, there were times when I hadn't eaten for days on end. Weak with hunger, I was walking as a wandering monk. He said, I could not go on anymore. I would sink at last, helpless and tired under a tree. Life would seem to be ebbing away. I could scarcely think, I'm quoting Vivekananda now directly, I could scarcely think until the mind again reverted to the same idea. I am it, I am it, I neither hunger nor thirst. Uh, arise, awake, uh, and walk on, stop not. And strength would come. I would feel reinvigorated. New light would come. And here I am, he says, here I am today before you, still living. And therefore, fear not, he says. Very powerful phrases. Whatever the difficulties, after all, it is but a dream. Mountain high though the difficulties may seem, terrible though the gloom may seem, it is but maya. Fear not, and it is banished. Crush it, and it vanishes. Stamp upon it, it dies. Never be afraid. Assert your glory. This is to be thought about, this is to be heard, this is to be thought upon, and it is to be meditated upon. The hands will work, but the mind must continuously re repeat, I am it, I am it. Till all gloom vanishes, till forever all littleness, all misery, and all evil are gone forever. Till the vision of truth shines forth forever, effortlessly, at every moment. Just like now we are effortlessly, we feel we are this little creature, then we will effortlessly know that we are that infinite light, that Purnam. And we always were, it was always our right. So that's where he concludes. Uh, let me do the peace chant and then we'll do a short Q&A. Actually, we have time for a short 10-minute Q&A. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, to the Holy Mother, to Swami Vivekananda. May they bless us by their blessings. May this realization come into our lives. In this life itself, may we be blessed. So there'll be a microphone. You raise your hand and make it short and sharp. Don't take up all of the 10 minutes with your question. And I'll try to give short and sharp replies. Um, anybody wants to ask a question? No? This is your chance. There, there, on your left. Tell us your name and ask a question. Shuman uh, Prataparati, I will ask one question which hopefully you have no answer, but you choose. I felt that the Yolo people also believe in Atma. They don't know. That's their selfie. They will survive them. The Yolo people, they believe in the Atman? They don't know that. They don't know that. They selfie and it survives them. Uh, yes, the, you live only once, people, yes. The sense of self is always there. The sense of self, sense of self is always there. We don't investigate it. And that's the whole thing. Yeah. Then there was somebody else, uh, the lady here. Tell us your name and ask the question. My name is Christine. Christine. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? <laughs> oh, uh, there is, uh, well, there is a book um, by Michio Kaku, The God Equation. I just bought it before coming here. It's a short book. He's a Japanese, a Japanese uh, physicist and very enthusiastic. And, and he has such a command over the subject. So basically, the book is about the latest in string theory. 
so that's one thing I'm reading now. And there's always some Advaitic stuff which I'm reading as part of my daily thing. So there is, right now it is, um, most of the time it is Ashtabhakra, and now also it's Ashtabhakra. <laughs> You have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I know a lot of the time it's stressed that to realize our true nature, uh, that we are godly. And, but there's also a lot of stress that to, so that we are not reborn. Yes. Why, why should I be, why should focus on that also rather than, you know, just focus on the All right. this life and... Right. Yeah. So why uh, this focus on the not being reborn? Again, this is something that people told me, that you're going to the West, this concept of multiple lives and karma and reincarnation is not part of the thought structure here in the West. It's sort of axiomatic in India, especially Indian thought. Uh, one uh, Swami said, notice, there are vast differences in Indian thought. You believe in God, the Buddhist doesn't believe in God. You believe in an immortal soul. The Buddhist doesn't believe in an immortal soul. And yet, with these vast differences, two things are common to all Indian schools, again, except the, the Charvaka, the materialist. The, two things are common, karma and reincarnation. That there is cause and effect, causality. Swami Vivekananda says, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. But whosoever wears a form must wear the chain too. The chain, cause and effect, past karma, which is giving rise to this life. Of course, what does Vedanta do? Swami Vivekananda says, but far beyond name and form is Atman never free. No, thou art that sannyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. So that's what Vedanta does. It sets you free from this. Now, why? Uh, why should you talk about birth and rebirth? Therefore, uh, if this concept is difficult to understand, you can put it in another way. The whole point is to be free of suffering, to transcend you know, the freedom which Swami Vivekananda talks about, transcend limitation, attain fulfillment, and rise above suffering. And that's a project anybody can get behind. In fact, that's the only human project that we have. Not only human, every sentient being is trying to attain fulfillment and avoid suffering, or overcome, transcend suffering. Notice, whatever we do, I mean, a very good scientist here, um, the big picture, Sean Carroll. So there he writes, at the end of the book, he writes, I was disappointed, actually. He, he writes that, no, we, this search for uh, happiness, this is, too, this is not really true. Uh, I mean, I pursue scientific knowledge, and I'm willing to put up with a lot of unhappiness so that I can get results to my scientific quest. But that's no argument at all. You just have to ask. Professor, if you get the results of your uh, experiments, does that please you or displease you? It pleases me. You are chasing happiness. It may be in different form. It may not be in the form of a smiley YOLO, where you live on uh, <laughs> selfie. Not in that form. It may be in a much more deep and profound form. The search for happiness and the quest to overcome suffering. That, in terms of Indian philosophy, translates into multiple lifetimes and this cycle of birth and death. So it's often put in that way, freedom from the cycle of birth and death. If you say, I don't believe in birth and freedom, you know, past lives, future lives, and only this much, this life, fine. The same thing can be put in another way, and it has been put. Atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda praptischa. Complete cessation of um, suffering and uh, the attainment of fulfillment or bliss. Yes. Okay, two more questions and we'll end. We are running out of time. Swamiji, actually, my name is Gautam. I actually have two questions. They're both short. Okay, quick. The first is, I would like to start uh, reading the complete works. Yes. Do you recommend that I pick up all the volumes, or how do I start? Pick up all the volumes. It's good to have it in the house. It's a blessing to have those volumes in the house. But start with um, uh, Swami Vivekananda's, uh, you know, start with Sister Nivedita's introduction. Very powerful. Every sentence is worth its weight in gold. Uh, very considered, well-written introduction. Then go on to Swami Vivekananda's Chicago addresses. That's how Swami Vivekananda became known to the West, just as a way of starting. Then go on to, um, there are four yogas. So, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raja Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. Now, you can go that way. You can do Jnana Yoga first, Karma Yoga next, Raja Yoga. But I, for example, st when I was a kid, I started with Raja Yoga. Uh, and then much later read, read Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. The novelist, 
Salinger. Hmm. He used to go through the uh, East Side Center in New York. They made a movie about him recently. They called, they called the movie The Rebel in the Rye. The, 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 yeah, The Catcher in the Rye, so play on that, Rebel in the Rye. And they show him talking to Swami Nikhilan and then Anyway, he mentions, he, he writes that these are two classics our American youth would do well to keep in their pockets. The karma Yoga and Raja Yoga, he says. <laughs> so read those. Then read uh, the... Um, uh, letters of Swami Vivekananda, that's very special. The conversations between the Swami and the disciple, the inspired talk, uh, the lectures from, to his lectures in India, from Colombo to uh, Almora. And uh, these are the highlights, but there are so many other things, even down to the stray observations, so powerful. Just this lecture, which is just scattered notes, basically. It's not even a complete, uh, uh, what I use today. But that phrase, the infinite is the finite. And the finite alone is the infinite. Yeah. And second question, uh, Drik Dishu Viveka. Oh, yes. No, no, go, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, could you give us the, I, I took your class for Drik Dishu Viveka. Could you give us the short version of it for everyone? Short. <laughs> <laughs> so there are 12, 12 hours of classes. <laughs> But he, Gautam thinks if he can compress 5,000 years of thought into five minutes, he can do 12 hours in, what, 12 seconds? Uh, so it's a very powerful introduction to Advaita Vedanta. And I use it to introduce Advaita Vedanta. That's not the traditional way it should be done. Traditionally, you should go to Vedanta Sara, which I've done recently. So you can go there also. So Vedanta Sara is like a book of definitions. People might be put off because it's a little dry. What is Brahman? What is Maya? What is body? What is mind? But it's important to know all that when you want to go deeper into Vedanta. But Drik Drishya Viveka is a very exciting book. From the very first verse, you are plunged into the highest truth. So it's a very tasty introduction uh, to Advaita Vedanta. Do look it up. There are 12 talks which were given right here uh, in this hall uh, at Hollywood. Okay. Swami. La oh, yeah. All right, we'll take, we, we have two minutes more. Uh, my name is Sangeeta, I have a question. Uh, so we have, uh, in this world, we have different roles mm. and duties and obligations associated with them. Mm. So how do, you, how do you think we can be free? Ah, how do you think you can be free of duties and obligations? Mm. You are already free. None of those duties and obligations can bind you. You were there before those duties and obligations ca came along. You will be there long after those duties and obligations have gone. New duties and obligations will come along, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but note that you are all the time free. How so? Every night when you fall asleep, the world disappears, the body disappears, people disappear, duties and obligations disappear. You go into a dream world, separate world. That also stops. You are not stuck to this waking world. You are not stuck to this uh, dream world. You are not stuck to the deep sleep either. That's a very philosophical sense in which you are free. But uh, freedom, I mean, it's good to talk philosophy, but if you want practical advice to make this freedom solid, Swami Vivekananda is very lectured. I didn't have time to say. He says, ultimately, it all depends upon you. Who else will set you free but you yourself? And then he says, from the quoting from the Gita, you are your own greatest enemy, you are your own greatest friend. To summarize in a few seconds, when are you your greatest enemy? When are you your greatest friend? You are your greatest enemy when, we are our greatest enemy when we work selfishly, ceaselessly for the sake of this little body mind. We are our greatest friend when we work selflessly for all that is around us. Could be the whole community, could just be people in your family. More selflessly we work, more you are friend to yourself. The more our desires are scattered in a hundred different channels in the world, the, the worse enemy we are of ourselves. The more all our desires are concentrated, focused into one all-consuming love for God, bhakti, then you are your greatest friend. The more our thoughts are scattered in a thousand directions, the more you are your greatest enemy. The more the thoughts are stilled, one-pointed, focused, inward, the, you are your greatest friend. And above all, 
When you do not know yourself, you are your greatest enemy. When you know yourself with capital S, Purnam, you are your greatest friend. Then you will enjoy and taste freedom. In the midst of all duties, when all the duties are there, no problem. When they are not there, no problem. Fine. Pranam Maharaj. So as What's you your said, name? Arjun Shah. So as you said that there are several births and desire will come, you will burn it and then it will extinguish. So I didn't say that. That's the uh, Buddhist approach. That's the Buddhist approach. So I have so many desires and life continues to give me so many career goals and everything. Yes. So do I have a control over that I can burn all the desire in this life or like how do I do it? Like yeah. goals continue to come in my life. True. Goals and desires. Desires come first and then the goals. Investigate. You don't have to burn up the desires. You don't have to give up the goals. But first, investigate. Think about it. What is really my goal? What is the one desire underlying all desires? It is to be happy. I'm doing everything for the happiness of this one self. Now, how do I truly become happy? And then you investigate. What are these things which I've been doing? Have they really made me happy? And what is possible? Is it really possible to be happy, more happy, deeply happy, lastingly happy? That's what Vedanta is saying. Don't make any radical change. You cannot until your very philosophy of life changes. There was a gentleman, young man, who said, oh, I, I don't like all this philosophy. All my, uh, I really love my job. I've got a wonderful job in a, one of the top companies of the world. So somebody asked him, uh, a philosopher asked him, oh, really? So you love the job more than anything else? Yes. All right, you can do the job, but you won't be paid your salary. <laughs> you can do, the, just keep on doing the work. So no, 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 I, I want the money too. Which one, if you are given a choice between the two, which one would you want? I'd want the money. <laughs> okay, you will get all the money you're getting. You get all the money, but, but you can't spend it. <laughs> no, 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 I want to spend it. I want to spend it for my wife and kids and my friends uh, and for myself. I want to spend it. So all right, you can spend it, but, um, and you can spend it for your wife and kids and friends, but they will no longer be your wife, your kids, your friends. Just be people. No, 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 they must be mine. <laughs> Ultimately, it comes back to me, mine, this, this. In an uh, ignorant way, it leads to unhappiness. If I see the I, this is this little body mind, it will never lead to fulfillment. So we must ultimately investigate, what am I? And as we get into a wider appreciation of what I am, then all these things will start making sense. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Yeah.